Hello, thank you for joining me today. We're reading through A Course of Miracles, the main text, and today we are going to be reading out of chapter 16, The Forgiveness of Illusions. So there's seven sections in this chapter. Um, I haven't scrolled through it to see exactly how long those seven sections are. We'll try and read for about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. And maybe we'll get through this whole chapter. I don't know. We'll see. Section one is true empathy. To empathize does not mean to join in suffering, for that is what you must refuse to understand. That is the ego's interpretation of empathy, and it is always used to form a special relationship in which the suffering is shared. The capacity to empathize is very useful to the Holy Spirit, provided you let him use it in his way. He does not understand suffering and would have you teach it is not understandable. He does not understand suffering and would have you teach it is not understandable. When he relates through you, he does not relate through your ego to another ego. He does not join in pain. Understanding that healing pain is not accomplished by delusional attempts to enter into it and lighten it by sharing the delusion. The clearest proof that empathy as the ego use it, it, uses it is destructive lies in the fact that it is applied only to certain types of problems and in certain people. These it selects out and joins with, and it never joins except to strengthen it. Make no mistake about this maneuver. The ego always empath emphasizes to weaken, and to weaken is always to attack. You do not know what empathizing means. Yet if this you may be sure, yet of this you may be sure, if you will merely sit quietly by and let the Holy Spirit relate through you, you will empathize with strength and will gain in strength and not in weakness. Your part is only to remember this, you do not want anything you value to come of a relationship. You choose neither to hurt it nor heal it in your own way. You do not know what healing is. All you have learned of empathy is from the past. And there is nothing from the past that you would share, for there is nothing from the past that you would keep. Do not use empathy to make the past real and so perpetuate it. Step gently aside and let healing be done for you. Keep but one thought in mind and do not lose sight of it, however tempted you may be to judge any situation and to determine your response by judging it. Focus your mind only on this. I am not alone and I would not intrude the past upon my guest. I have invited him, and he is here. I need do nothing except not to interfere. True empathy is of him who knows what it is. You will learn his interpretation of it if you let him use your capacity for strength and not for weakness. He will not desert you but be sure that you de desert not him. Humility is strength in this sense only, that to recognize and accept the fact that you do not know is to recognize and accept the fact that he does know. You are not sure that he will do his part because you have never yet done yours completely. You cannot know how to respond to what you do not understand. Be tempted not in this, and yield not to the ego's triumphant use of empathy for its glory. The triumph of weakness is not what you would offer to a brother, and yet you recognize no triumph but this. This is not knowledge, and the form of empathy which would bring this about is so distorted that it would imprison what it would release. 
The unredeemed cannot redeem, yet they have a redeemer. Attempt to teach him not, for this will never bring peace to anyone. Offer your empathy to him, for it is his perception and his strength that you would share. And let him offer you his strength and his perception to be shared with you. The meaning of love is lost in any relationship that looks to weakness and hopes to find love there. The power of love, which is its meaning, lies in the strength of God that hovers over it and blesses it silently by enveloping it in healing wings. Let this be and do not try to substitute your miracle for this. I have said that if a brother asks a foolish thing of you, to do it. But be certain that this does not mean to do a foolish thing that would hurt either him or you. For what would hurt one will hurt the other. Foolish requests are foolish merely because they conflict, since they always contain some element of specialness. Only the Holy Spirit recognizes foolish needs as well as real ones, and he will teach you how to meet both without losing either. You will attempt to do this only in secrecy, and you will think that by meeting the needs of one, you do not jeopardize another, because you keep them separate and secret from each other. That is not the way, for it leads to no life. I'm sorry, that is not the way, for it leads not to life and truth. No needs will long be left unmet if you leave them all to him whose function it is to meet them. That is his function and not yours. He will not meet them secretly, for he would share everything you give through him. That is why he gives it. What you give through him is for the whole sonship, not for part of it. Leave him his function, for he will fulfill it if you but ask him to enter your relationships and bless them for you. Oh, there was something I really wanted to dig in for a second on. For what one hurt, for what would hurt one will hurt another. This is a, a really critical piece to understand that when we do things, whether it be speaking or thinking or acting, when we do things to another, we are doing whatever to ourselves as well. There is no separation here. You can't hurt someone else and not hurt yourself. You can't cheat someone else and not cheat yourself. Doesn't matter what you want to substitute in that wording. We are one, it's a unified fabric. Moving on, chapter 16, the forgiveness of illusions, section two, the power of holiness. You may still think that holiness is impossible to understand because you cannot see how it can be extended to include everyone. And you have been told that it must include everyone to be holy. Concern yourself not with the extension of holiness, for the nature of miracles you do not understand, nor do you do them. It is their extension far beyond the limits you perceive that demonstrates you do not do them. Why should you worry how the miracle extends to all the sonship when you do not understand the miracle itself. One attribute is no more difficult to understand than is the whole. If miracles are at all, their attributes would have to be miraculous, being part of them. There is a tendency to fragment and then to be concerned about the truth of just a little part of the whole. And this is but a way of avoiding or looking away from the whole to think you might be better able to understand. For this is but another way in which you will try and keep understanding to yourself. 
a better and far more helpful way to think of miracles is this. You do not understand them, either in part or in whole. Yet they have been done through you. Therefore, your understanding cannot be necessary. Yet it is simple, it is still impossible to accomplish what you do not understand. And so there must be something in you that does understand. To you, the miracle cannot seem real because what you have done to hurt your mind has made it so unnatural that it does not remember what is natural to it. And when you are told what is natural, you cannot understand it. The recognition of the part as whole and of the whole in every part is perfectly natural, for it is the way God thinks, and what is natural to him is natural to you. Holy perception would show you instantly that order of difficulty in miracles is quite impossible, for it involves a contradiction of what miracles mean. And if you could understand their meaning, their attributes could, would hardly cause you perplexity. You have done miracles, but it is quite apparent that you have not done them alone. You have succeeded whenever you have reached another mind and joined with it. When two minds join as one and share one idea equally, the first link in the awareness of the sonship as one has been made. When you have made this joining as the Holy Spirit bids you and have offered it to him to use as he sees fit, his natural perception of your gift enables him to understand it and you to use his understanding on your behalf. It is impossible to convince you of the reality of what has clearly been accomplished through your willingness while you believe that you must understand it or else it is not real. How faith in reality be how can faith in reality be yours while you are bent on making it unreal and are you really safer in maintaining the reality of illusions than you would be in joyously accepting truth for what it is and grant giving thanks for it honor the truth that has been given you and be glad that you do not understand it Miracles are natural to the one who speaks for God, for his task is to translate the miracle into the knowledge which represents it and which is hidden to you. His understanding of the miracle be enough for you. Let his understanding of the miracle be enough for you, and do not turn away from all the witnesses that he has given you to his reality. No evidence will convince you of the truth of what you do not want. Yet your relationship with him is real. Regard this not with fear, but with rejoicing. The one you called upon is with you. Bid him welcome and honor the witnesses who bring you the glad tidings. He has come. It is true, just as you fear, that to acknowledge him is to deny all that what you think you know. But what you think you know was never true. What gain is there to your clinging to it and denying the evidence for truth? For you have come too near to truth to renounce it now, and you will yield to its compelling attraction. You can delay this now, but only a little while. The host of God has called to you, and you have heard. Never again will you be wholly willing not to listen. This is a year of joy in which your listening will increase and peace will grow with its increase. The power of holiness and the weakness of attack are both being brought into your awareness. And this has been accomplished in a mind firmly convinced that holiness is weakness and attack is power. Should this not be a sufficient miracle to teach you that your teacher is not of you? But remember also that whatever you listen, whenever you listened to his interpretation, the results have brought you joy. Would you prefer the results of your interpretation, considering honestly what they have been?
God wills you better. Could you not look with greater charity on whom God loves with perfect love? Do not interpret against God's love, for you have many witnesses that speak of it so clearly that only the blind and deaf could fail to see and hear them. This year, determine not to deny what has been given you by God, for that is the only reason he has called to you. His voice has spoken clearly, and yet you have so little faith in what you heard, because you have preferred to place still greater faith in the disaster you have made. Today, let us resolve together to, to accept the joyful tidings that disaster is not real, and that reality is not disaster. Reality is safe and sure and wholly kind to everyone and everything. There is no greater love than to accept this and be glad. For love asks only that you be happy and will give you everything that makes happiness, makes for happiness. You will never be given any problem to the Holy Spirit. He has not solved for you, nor will you ever do so. You have never tried to solve anything yourself and been successful. Is it not time you brought these facts together and made sense of them? This is the year for application of the ideas that have been given you. For the ideas are mighty forces and to be used and not held idly by. They have already proved their power sufficiently for you to place your faith in them and not in their denial. This year, invest in truth and let it work in peace. Have faith in him who has faith in you. Think what you have been really seen and heard and recognize it. Can you be alone with witnesses like this? Great section. Reading on, chapter 16, The Forgiveness of Illusions, section 3, The Reward of Teaching. We have already learned that everyone teaches and teaches all the time. You may have taught well, and yet you may not have learned how to accept the comfort of your teaching. If you will consider what you have taught and how alien it is to what you have thought you knew, you will be compelled to realize that your teacher came from beyond your thought system. Therefore, he could look upon it fairly and perceive it as untrue. He must have done so from the basis of a very different thought system and one with nothing in common with yours. For certainly what he has taught and what you have taught through him have nothing in common with what you taught before he came. And the results have been to bring peace where there was pain and suffering has disappeared to be replaced by joy. You may have taught freedom, but you have not learned how to be free. I said earlier, by their fruits we shall know them and they shall know themselves. For it is certain that you judge yourself according to your teaching. The ego's teaching produces immediate results because its decisions are immediately accepted as your choice. And this acceptance means that you are willing to judge yourself accordingly. Cause and effect are very clear in the ego's thought system because all your learning has been directed towards establishing the relationship between them. And would you not have faith in what you have so diligently taught yourself to believe? Yet remember how much care you have exerted in choosing its witnesses and in avoiding those which spoke for the cause of truth and its effects. Does not the fact that you have not learned what you have taught show you that you do not perceive the sonship as one? And does it not also show you that you do not regard yourself as one? For it is impossible to teach successfully wholly without conviction, and it is equally impossible that conviction be outside of you. 
You, should, you could never have taught freedom unless you did believe in it. And it must be that you taught, and it must be that what you taught came from yourself. Yet this self you clearly do not know and do not recognize. It even, oh, and do not recognize it even though it functions. What functions must be there? And it is only if you deny what it has done that you could possibly deny its presence. This is a course in how to know yourself. You have taught what you are, but have not let what you are teach you. You have been very careful to avoid the obvious and not to see the real cause and effect relationship that is perfectly apparent. Yet within you is everything you taught. What can it be that has not learned it? It must be this part that is really outside yourself, not by your own perception, but in truth. And it is this part that you have taken in that is not you. What you accept into your mind does not really change it. Illusions are but beliefs in what is not there. And the seeming conflict between truth and illusion can only be resolved by separating yourself from the illusion and not from the truth. It must be this part that is really outside yourself, not by your own projection, but in truth. And it is this part that you have taken in that is not you. What you accept into your mind does not really change it. Illusions are but beliefs in what is not there. And the seeming conflict between truth and illusion can only be restored by separating yourself from the illusion and not from truth. Your teaching has already done this, for the Holy Spirit is part of you. Created by God, he left neither God nor his creation. He is both God and you, as you are God and him together. For God's answer to the separation added more to you than you tried to take away. He protected both your creations and you together, keeping one with you what you would exclude, and they will take the place of what you took in to replace them. They are quite real as part of the self you do not know. They communicate to you through the Holy Spirit and their power and gratitude to you for their creation. They offer gladly to your teaching of yourself, who is their home. You who are host to God are also host to them. For nothing real has ever left the mind of its creator. And what is not real was never there. You are not two selves in conflict. What is beyond God? If you who hold, hold him and whom he holds are the universe, all else must be outside where nothing is. You have taught this, and from far off in the universe, yet not beyond yourself, the witness to your teaching have gathered to help you learn. Their gratitude has joined with yours and God's to strengthen your faith in what you taught. And what you taught is true. Alone you stand outside your teaching and apart from it. But with them you must learn what you but taught yourself and learned from the conviction you shared with them. This year you will begin to learn and make learning commensurate with teaching. You have chosen this by your own willingness to teach. Though you seem to suffer for it, the joy of teaching will yet be yours. For the joy of teaching is in the learner who offers it to the teacher in gratitude and shares it with him. As you learn, your gratitude to, your, to yourself, who teaches you what he is, will grow and help you honor him and you will learn his power and strength and purity and love as his father does. 
His kingdom has no limits and no end, and there is nothing in him that is not perfect and eternal. All this is you, and nothing outside of this is you. To your most holy self, all praise is due for what you are, and for what he is who created you as you are. Sooner or later, must everyone bridge the gap he imagines exists between his selves. Each one builds this bridge, which carries him across the gap as soon as he is willing to expend some little effort on behalf of bridging it. His little efforts are powerfully supplemented by the strength of heaven and by the united will of all who make heaven what it is, by being joined within it. And so the one who would cross over is literally transported there. Your bridge is built stronger than you think, and your foot is planted firmly on it. Have no fear that the attraction of those who stand on the other side and wait for you will not draw you safely across, for you will come where you would be and where yourself awaits you. So before I uh, go on, I want to just take a moment um, to just speak in my terms and my language about what this chapter is talking or section is talking about. We are divinity in form. So God, whatever you want to call it, the universe, whatever your word is, divinity, created us. And we are not separate from God. We are God. We are God in form. And everyone is God in form. And we are all one. And although you look around and you think that you see individual things and objects, what we know from science is that if you take anything and you put it under the strongest microscope we have, it all looks the same and it's all moving. Now that doesn't matter whether it's a rock or a piece of your skin or a tree. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be a piece of a computer part. Put it under the strongest microscope we have no matter what it is, it looks the same, and it's moving. So all that you see in this physical realm is an illusion. What you see through that microscope, that's where the truth is. The truth is we're all made of the same stuff. We're all one. And it doesn't matter whether you're an inanimate object or an animate object. It's animate. It's moving. Doesn't mean it has life as such, but it has thought. So I hope that helps sort of clear it up. You are, oh, there's one other thing I wanted to uh, add to that. Um, so the, the, uh, the essence of Christ, of uh, the person that this book, refers to as his son or the sonship, that is also within each and every one of us. That energy, that beingness is there and is available to everyone who reaches out and connects with it. So Jesus was not an individual person that lived and died and that's where it ended. And then we have, you know, the great book of the Bible that tells all the stories that everybody believes in and follows. That isn't really how it, it worked. He, he didn't die. And in essence, he is in all of us now. Every single one of us. You're not aware that he's there. That's okay. He's still there. You may be aware that he's there, and that's great if you do. Anybody who's aware of Christ's uh, uh, within them is uh, uh, further on their path of learning than, um, than those who don't, aren't aware of his being with us. Um, but I, help, I hope that helps. I hope it didn't muddy the waters here. So let's read on a little more. 
Chapter 16, The Forgiveness of Illusions, Section 4, The Illusion and the Reality of Love. Be not afraid to look upon the special hate relationship, for freedom lies in looking at it. It would be impossible not to know the meaning of love except for this. For the special love relationship in which the meaning of love is hidden is undertaken solely to offset the hate, but not to let it go. Your salvation will rise clearly before your eyes as you look on this. You cannot limit hate. The special love relationship will not offset it, but will merely drive it underground and out of sight. It is essential to bring it into sight and to make no attempt to hide it, for it is the attempt to balance hate with love that makes love meaningless to you. The extent of the split that lies in this you do not realize, and until you do, the split will remain unrecognized and therefore unhealed. The symbols of hate against the symbols of love play out a conflict that does not exist. For symbols stand for something, and the symbol of love is without meaning if love is everything. You will go through this last undoing quite unharmed and will at last emerge as yourself. This is the last step in readiness for God. Be not unwilling now, you are too near, and you will cross the bridge in perfect safety, translated quietly from war to peace. For the illusion of love will never satisfy, but its reality, which awaits you on the other side, will give you everything. The special love relationship is an attempt to limit the destructive effects of hate by finding a haven in the storm of guilt. It makes no attempt to rise above the storm into sunlight. On the contrary, it emphasizes the guilt outside the haven by attempting to build barricades against it and keep within them. The special love relationship is not perceived as a value in itself but as a place of safety from which hatred is split off and kept apart. The special love partner is acceptable only as long as he serves this purpose. Sorry about that. Hatred can either can enter and indeed is welcome in some aspects of the relationship, but it is held together by the illusion of love. If the illusion goes, the relationship is broken or becomes unsatisfying on the grounds of disillusionment. Love is not an illusion. Love is a fact. Where disillusionment is possible, there was not love but hate. For hate is an illusion, and what can change was never love. It is sure that those who select certain ones as partners in any aspect of living and use them for any purpose which they would not share with others are trying to live with guilt rather than die of it. This is the choice they see, and love to them is only an escape from death. They seek it desperately, but not in the peace in which it would gladly come quietly to them. And when they find the fear of death is still upon them, the love relationship loses the illusion that it is what it is not. When the barricades against are broken, fear rushes in and hatred triumphs. There are no triumphs of love. Only hate is at all concerned with the triumph of love. The illusion of love can triumph over the illusion of hate, but always at the price of making both illusions. As long as the illusion of hatred lasts, so long will love be an illusion to you. And then the only choice remaining possible is which illusion you prefer. There is no conflict in the choice between truth and illusion. Seen in these terms, no one would hesitate. But conflict enters the instant the choice seems to be one between illusions. 
but this choice does not matter. Where one choice is as dangerous as another, the decision must be one of despair. Your task is not to seek for love, but merely to seek and find all of the barriers within yourself that you have built against it. It is not necessary to seek for what is true, but it is necessary to seek for what is false. Every illusion is one of fear, whatever form it takes. And the attempt to escape from one illusion to another must fail. If you seek love outside yourself, you can be certain you perceive hatred within and are afraid of it. Yet peace will never come from the illusion of love, only from its reality. Recognize this, for it is true, and truth must be recognized if it is to be distinguished from illusion. The special love relationship is an attempt to bring love into fear and make it real in fear. The fun, in fundamental violation of love's condition, the special love relationship would accomplish the impossible. How but in an illusion could this be done? It is essential that we look very closely at exactly what it is you think you can do to solve the dilemma which seems very real to you, but which does not exist. You have come close to the truth, and only this stands between you and the bridge that leads into it. Heaven waits silently, and your creations are holding out their hands to help you cross and welcome them. For it is they you seek. You seek but for your own completion, and it is they who render you complete. The special love relationship is but a shabby institute for what makes you whole in truth, not an illusion. Your relationship with them is without guilt, and this enables you to look on all your brothers with gratitude, because your creations were created in union with them. Acceptance of your creations is the oneness of creation, without which you would never be complete. No specialness can offer you what God has given and what you are joined with him in giving. Across the bridge is your completion, for you will be holy in God, willing for nothing special, but only to be holy like him, completing him by your completion. Fear not to cross to the abode of peace and perfect holiness. Only there is the completion of God and of his Son established forever. Seek not for this in the bleak world of illusion, where nothing is certain and where everything fails to satisfy. In the name of God, be wholly willing to abandon all illusions. In any relationship in which you are wholly willing to accept completion, and only this, there is God completed and his son with him. The bridge that leads to union in yourself must lead to knowledge, for it was built with God beside you and will lead you straight to him where your completion rests, wholly compatible, compatible with his. Every illusion you accept into your mind by judging it to be attainable removes your own sense of completion and thus denies the wholeness of your father. Every fantasy, be it of love or hate, deprives you of knowledge, for fantasies are the veil behind which truth is hidden. To lift the veil that seems so dark and heavy, it is only needful to value truth beyond all fantasy and to be entirely unwilling to settle for illusion in place of truth. Would you not go through fear to love? For such the journey seems to be. Love calls, but hate would have you stay. Hear not the call of hate and see no fantasies. See in the call of hate and in every fantasy that rises to delay you, but the call for help that rises ceaselessly from you to your creator. Would he not answer you whose completion is his? He loves you, wholly without illusion, as you must love. 
for love is holy without illusion and therefore holy without fear. Whom God remembers must be whole, and God has never forgotten what makes him whole. In your completion lie the memory of his wholeness and his gratitude to you for his completion. In his link with you lie both his inability to forget and your ability to remember. In him are joined your willingness to love and all the love of God, who you forget not. Your father can no more forget the truth in you than you can fail to remember it. The Holy Spirit is the bridge to him, made from your willingness to unite with him and created by his joy in union with you. The journey that has seemed endless is almost complete, for what is endless is very near. You have almost recognized it. Turn with me firmly away from all illusions now and let nothing stand in the way of truth. We will take the last useless journey away from truth together, and then together we go straight to God in joyous answer to his call for his completion. If special relationships of any kind would hinder God's completion, then can they have any value to you? What would interfere with God must interfere with you. Only in time does interference in God's completion seem to be possible. The bridge he would carry you across lifts you from time into eternity. Waken from time and answer fearlessly the call of him who gave eternity to you in your creation. On this side of the bridge to timelessness, you understand nothing. But as you step lightly across it, upheld by timelessness, you are directed straight to the heart of God. At its center and only there, you are safe forever, because you are complete forever. There is no veil the love of God in us together cannot lift. The way to truth is open. Follow it with me. Okay, I think we're going to call that it for today. We've still got three sections to read in this chapter, and uh, they look to be fairly long, each one of them. So rather than um, running long or, or being too much, we'll just break it here. And uh, I'll see you here next Sunday for the, next, uh, for the rest of this chapter. And there are the daily lessons that are also rolling out. So um, thank you for joining me. And until next time, namaste and much love.